my great honor and pleasure to be the moderator of the first panel on the probably most important topic, a topic that we hear about uh, every day when we open the newspapers, when we open the internet, uh, when we open our fridges, we see Brexit. Uh, it's the most important topic, people that live with it, people can't live without it, and everybody's tired of it, but many are still passionate about it. Um, we will have uh, very special speakers who have very different viewpoints, but we're here because of the 60 million Congress. Something that unites us is our love for Poland, our interest in Poland. Um, the 60 million Congress, just to repeat, is a wonderful initiative. 60 million, meaning 40 million Poles living in Poland and 20 million Poles living all around the world. Over a million uh, Poles living in the United Kingdom, millions living in Americas. We are a power that we don't realize how strong we are and what influence we can have over world's politics. Um, it's wonderful that we're, through this Congress we're connecting people, not just talking about politics, culture, but it's also sports. And I know many of you will be playing golf tomorrow as part of the 60 million Congress, which is a great addition and a great networking opportunity. But without further ado, could I uh, invite and introduce my speakers for the first panel, which is, first of all, who's already sitting, Daniel Kapczynski, Member of Parliament for Shrewsbury and Acham, Chairman of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Poland, a great friend of the Polish cause in Parliament. Welcome. I also invite Anna Maria Anders, State Secretary of the Polish Government, Plenipotentiary for International Dialogue and Prime Minister's Chancery, future ambassador to Poland, uh, of Poland to Rome, uh, <laughs> possibly. I'm very jealous of the Poles in Italy. <laughs> Could I also invite Stephen Pound, who is translated in Polish to Stefan Fund, who is a <laughs> Labour Member of Parliament. Stefan <laughs> Labour Member of Parliament for Team North, a veteran MP, should I say. Just say uh, old. <laughs> he is a Member of Parliament Stephen, since 1997, MP, still looking so young. <laughs> Welcome. Could I also invite uh, James Rogers, Director, Global Britain Programme, Henry Jackson Society, one of the founders of the Society. Welcome. And last but not least, Marcin Kruszczel, member of the Nova Confederacja Think Tank, author of many publications on the relations with the European Union. Welcome. We have about an hour for our questions and answers. <coughs> if we have any time left, we'll have a chance to, uh, for you, for the public, to ask some questions to our distinguished guests. Um, I have a question each for each uh, one of the panelists uh, to begin with. Uh, if I could kindly ask you to not go over four minutes so everybody has the time to um, speak without uh, stress. Could I uh, begin with uh, Anna Maria Anders? The Law and Justice Party received more than 45% of votes in the recent European parliamentary elections, more than any other party in the history of Polish elections in the last 30 years. Brussels sometimes seemed to be at odds with the Polish Conservative government, yet the majority of Poles support membership of the European Union. What is the future of the relations between Warsaw and Brussels after these elections? Will Brexit have a negative effect on the Polish-British relations or not? Yes, I think um, uh, as somebody who is part of the government, uh, I think uh, none of us expected us to do as well as we did, you know. I mean, one always hopes, but we had so many attacks on, from the opposition uh, that I think we were all a little bit worried. Um, so anyway, huge success for us. Uh, what difference will it make? Well, I think it's too early to say. Um, I think generally, um, certainly uh, looking at Europe, 
um, people from the right wing gained a lot of seats, but people also from the left gained seats. The centre left and the centre right didn't do quite so well. Um, it's only when uh, they actually go to Brussels and then sit there, uh, we can figure out which way it's going to go. But certainly, the chances are it will be more fragmented uh, because um, the, uh, there will be more right-wing people, there will be more nationalist people. There will, I hate to call them nationalists or communists, but say right-wing, uh, than there were. So there will be less agreement uh, on issues. Um, I'm always very clear when I speak about Poland's dispute with the European Union. Of course we want to stay in the European Union, over 80% of people uh, want to. But the thing is, we don't want to be told always what to do. We want to have our own sovereignty, we want to have our own opinion, and not just be, uh, be commanded. And I think that is the reason that actually the right wing all over Europe uh, did better than, uh, than before. Uh, Brexit, uh, to me, um, I normally don't like to speak about Brexit because being a British citizen and at the same time a member of the Polish government, I'm torn. What I may privately feel is good for Britain um, is not going to be good for Poland because Poland, I feel, should stay within the European Union. But I can honestly say from my heart, this is the most embarrassing, embarrassing process I have ever seen. Uh, we were the laughing stock, I speak now as a Brit, a laughing stock of the whole world. It took three and a half years not to be able to get a deal together. I used to watch this thing, I thought I cannot watch three, Prime Minister May or Donald Tusk on TV anymore. And I think a lot of people felt this way. So I think we've got to move on, we've got to, uh, we've, the Brits, the British people have to decide which way we're going to go. But I think it's safe to say that Poland will go along um, we are with Britain because it's one of our closest friends and closest allies, uh, but at the same time, the, Brit the Poles, for the moment anyway, would like to stay within Europe. Um, summing up, I think it's too soon to say we have to see when, uh, when everybody sits down in the Parliament. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate your insight and uh, you're known uh, uh, amongst, here, especially here in Parliament, uh, to be uh, such a great uh, promoter of Poland. And uh, I've heard many comments from the uh, various ministers uh, about you, how great it is to speak with you. Uh, so your insights on this topic are very, uh, very valuable to us. Um, could I ask the uh, next panelist now, uh, Daniel Kaczynski, who is also the host of us uh, here. Uh, without him, we would not be able to uh, probably organize this event in the Houses of Parliament. Uh, so I'm very grateful for that uh, as well. He's a powerhouse for Poland in the British Parliament, uh, fighting for uh, many of the uh, British and Polish interests at the same time. Um, one of the topics that's uh, quite important to Poles living in the UK are the rights of Polish citizens um, after Brexit. And you have supported your Conservative colleague, Alberto Costa, Member of Parliament in successfully securing the rights of EU citizens in an event of a no deal Brexit. And you have held many meetings with your government on how to protect the rights of Poles post Brexit. Despite that, many are still concerned that it won't be easy for Poles to come to Britain anymore after the UK leaves the EU. What's your view? Do Poles have a future in the UK? What country will Britain become after Brexit? Will Poles be valued and will the British-Polish relations deteriorate or continue strengthening? Well, thank you very much. Um, I think Senator Anders said that um, she believes that Poland ought to have her own opinion. Well, let me say to her, our experience being in the European Union is that you cannot and will not be allowed to have your own opinion if you remain a member of the European Parliament. That is one of the reasons why we want to leave. And I think it's the intransigence of the European Union towards us uh, which has caused us so many difficulties. The Senator again says that she's frustrated and disappointed that three years after the vote we still have not pulled out and the uncertainty that it causes and the disruption for businesses. Well, let me tell you, at the, from the British side of things, we are quietly appalled at the lack of respect and care towards us by the Commission. They simply don't understand how this country works and they have no comprehension 
about the sensitivity and the difficulties over the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, what we refer to as the Northern Ireland backstop. So if there are difficulties and if there are delays, I would put those squarely at the door of the European Union. Uh, the afternoon, uh, I think, I wanted to say that um, we have, one of the reasons why we are leaving the European Union is we have lost all confidence in that body. And I know that some of the panelists will disagree with me profoundly on this issue. But I think if we're going to have a debate, it's important to have different and polarizing views. We have lost all confidence in this organization from a democratic perspective, from a transparency perspective, and from a sovereignty perspective. And I'm very proud to have campaigned for Brexit, and I believe that this country will thrive in the post-Brexit era. There are dark forces at work, however, in this country who are attempting to thwart Brexit and to prevent us from leaving the European Union. We will be taking those dark forces on to ensure that the 17.4 million people who voted for Brexit, that their views are respected and that we will pull out. Let me say to you, ladies and gentlemen, that every time the people of any European Union nation have had the temerity to take on the European Union and the elites of Brussels, they have been told to think again. You've made a mistake this time. You need to vote again. Go back, have another referendum, carry on voting until you get it right this time. It happened in Denmark, if you will remember. It happened in Ireland, and it happened in France. Well, this time, they've picked a fight with the wrong people. We are not going to back down, we are not going to have another referendum, and we're going to pull out of this undemocratic and unaccountable organization. And then we're going to show others in Europe that we can cooperate, we can support with one another, but not to be in a political and currency union with one another. And we need to demonstrate to Poland, and by the way, 1939 is indelibly imprinted on my mind as it is on yours. I spent my childhood meeting with my beloved Polish grandfather, Roman Kowczynski, to hear what happened to him and his family and to our community in Kowal, in Wielkopolska, during the Second World War. So, of course, as a British parliamentarian, I am committed and very focused on protecting Poland from any adverse military threat that she may face during the course of our lifetimes. And it will be for Britain and America, and by the way, as you know, Britain and America combined are much larger than the whole of the European Union put together, but it will be for Britain and America, and let's not forget that 75% of these 20 million Poles that live around the world live in Britain and America and Canada, an Anglo-Saxon transatlantic alliance. It will be for us to demonstrate to Poland that we can give her what she wants trade and defense to the same degree that she will get from Germany without forcing Warsaw into a political and currency union with us. And I will leave you with that thought. Is it conceivable, is it practical, is it possible for Britain and America to give Poland security and trade to the same degree that Germany promises to give her without forcing Warsaw to abandon her currency and without forcing Warsaw to take ever more diktats from Brussels. That is my life's ambition, to demonstrate to Warsaw that we can and we will. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Um, it's such a great pity that uh, these panels are in English because uh, Daniel has been learning Polish and his Polish is uh, quite excellent so far and he's uh, improving himself uh, every day. Uh, so hopefully another Congress will have parts of it in, in Polish with a panel yeah. uh, for Daniel and others who are learning Polish who have not been uh, yet to comment. Ja tylko chciałem powiedzieć, że mój nauczyciel jest tutaj, pan, pan, Ber, pan Pandela z Krakowa. Pan Pandela przychodzi do mnie dwa razy w tygodniu do mojego biura i teraz 
później o, o, o pierwszej mamy następne lekcje razem w moim biurze. Jak Państwo znacie kogoś tutaj w Wielkiej Brytanii, który chciałby się uczyć polskiego, nie ma lepszego nauczyciela niż Pan Pandera. Thank you very much. Uh, for those who did not understand, uh, <laughs> I was just praising this Polish teacher, and I, as we can see, the effects uh, are uh, excellent. May I now ask uh, Stephen Pound, who may have slightly different views uh, on Brexit. Uh, Stephen, many call you the uh, local Polish ambassador in Ealing because of uh, your initiatives and a very active role in promoting and defending the good name uh, of Poland in your constituency and in Parliament. Um, many Poles uh, raise their concerns that Brexit is aimed against them and that many Brits voted for Brexit because they didn't like immigrants. What is the feeling, what is the vibe in the UK? Has the country really become less welcoming to foreigners? Should Poles still come to the UK to study and work, or should they stay away? Thank, thank you very much indeed. Panie Panowie, dziękuję bardzo. When I wish to be the Polish mayor of Ealing, they called me Polski Burmis na Ealingu. Uh, and I, I had to make occasional speeches in a language which I thought was Polish. Um, Panie Magosia was convinced was gibberish. Um, and everybody else, was, everybody else was extremely polite and nodded. But listen, thank you very much indeed. On behalf of the dark forces. <laughs> I um, pointed and he looked at you when I said that. Yes, I, 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 I felt it. When, when, when Daniel pats you on the back, it's only a recce for a knife, you just know. <laughs> but uh, can, can I just, um, before I respond to that, just say, um, Madam Anders, I have to say, there cannot be a more appropriate um, elevation than to the yeah, ambassadorship yeah. In, it, in Italy. As anyone who has stood on the slopes of Monte Cassino and seen the vast Polish cemetery there, a cemetery which doesn't just have Christian grave markings, but also Orthodox and Jewish, but at the base of that, the biggest mausoleum to General <coughs> Anders. Um, anyone who sees that realizes with great personal pride the contribution of the people who actually won the Battle of Monte Cassino, which was thought to be unwinnable. And I say, when people talk to me um, about Poles, are they welcome in this country? I often think, in 1939, nobody complained about free movement of labor. Nobody said we can't have free movement to RAF Northolt. Nobody said we can't have free movement to the North Atlantic where the Wiskiewicza sunk the Bismarck. Nobody said that we can't have free movement in North Africa, in Monte Cassino, and right the way across Europe. So I think we have to recognize that there is a bond, and I would say it's an indissoluble bond, between Poland and this country, because bonds forged in blood are unbreakable and I think our relationship is unbreakable. What I would say is that the United Kingdom was never ever wholly part of the European Union. We were not part of Schengen, we were not part uh, of the Euro. We, in many ways, were sort of a semi-detached group. And I think that that leads us forward to where we're going. I'm happy to talk about where we will go parliament in parliamentary and political terms, but it is crucial, I think, to respond to the question. Poles are welcome, will always be welcome, and not just welcomed on an emotional, on a sentimental basis, but on a sound economic basis. Has there ever been a community which has given so much to the host country? Has there ever been a community which has come and immediately got a reputation for hard work? I mean, my son's an electrician and he spends all day complaining about bloody Polish electricians. They turn up on time. They work to the contract. They clean up after them. How can an honest British electrician compete with that sort of behavior? And it's not just him. And it's not just now. It's throughout the time. How many people remember with all the business about the Empire Windrush, the HMT Empire Windrush, which has been on the front pages of all the papers? 66 of the passengers on Windrush were Poles, mostly families of General Anders' army, who had actually come all the way from Iran to North Africa to Mexico and back again. And those people, within six months, had learned to speak English, they'd sorted out their papers, they'd got jobs, and they'd bought houses in Ely. And isn't that a part of the hidden history, because people didn't recognize that. When I was at school, every Pavel was called Paul, every Magosha was called Margaret, and Bogdan was called Bill. We didn't know these people. It was only in 1966, the time of the Polish millennium, that the Polish community expressed its individual personality. And this is the crux of it. There was a sign during 
the June 2016 referendum in Southall, which said, vote to leave, we want more Punjabis and less Poles. That was one of the most offensive and unpleasant and aggressive signs I saw, and I made it my business to confront the Gudwara who had actually put this sign up. They didn't know what they were talking about because they used the word Pole as a sort of generic expression for European immigrants. People out of absurd, abysmal ignorance called Poles Eastern Europeans. And I have to explain, Eastern Europe is the Russian border. Poland is the heart of of Europe, the absolute beating heart of Europe. You're not Eastern Europeans, you're the heart of Europe. And I want my country to be with you as part of that European family. I'm from the generation that was in the armed forces. My father fought in the war, my grandfather fought in the war before that. I never ever want to fight other European nations. And I, as I look at the great powers, of not just in, in Russia and not just in the United States, but you look at the emerging powers and the, the danger that people like in, in, in North Korea do. We cannot respond to the challenges of the 21st century as one little rain-sodden island off the coast of Europe. The United Kingdom has to be with its European brothers and sisters. We have to do that. And as for the Poles, my friends, you are secure. You are welcome. You have earned the right. You have earned the right. You've paid for it in that hardest of all currencies, in the currency of blood, the currency of commitment, the currency of economic activity, the currency of being, if I may say, the best of good neighbours, and I never ever want to lose my good neighbours. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, passionate uh, speech. Uh, it really warms up my heart to hear you speak, uh, Stefan, each time, each time. Uh, uh, before we get to the other speakers, uh, you may disagree on Brexit, uh, Daniel and uh, Stefan, uh, but Daniel, do you agree that the polls should be valued uh, in the UK uh, in the future, post-Brexit? Tricky question, Daniel. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, look, I, I would say talk, that talk. Uh, what, uh, what really is very heartening for me uh, as a constituency MP like Stephen is that I get so many uh, business owners coming to see me um, specifically asking me to help them to find Polish workers. Um, quite extraordinary really and I'll just give you one very quick story. Uh, the gentleman who uh, owns 18 care homes uh, throughout the whole of Shropshire came to see me and said that I need you to find me uh, 20 Polish nurses. And I said, why can't you find local Salopian uh, people to work here? And they said, we've taken uh, a survey of all of the elderly people and they have specifically asked for polls because they are so attentive and caring to us and look after us and, and are kind to us. So you can imagine how happy and proud I was of that sort of comment. We also have in Shrewsbury Britain's largest beef processing factory. And when I went to see the directors of that company, and they took me into the boardroom, uh, they brought in some of the Polish workers, 50 of them, into the boardroom. And the managing director said to me, we cannot operate this plant without the skills and the contribution of the Polish workers. So of course we understand the huge benefits that highly skilled, highly educated, Polish citizens are contributing to the United Kingdom. But Brexit does not mean, as some would like you to think it means, that we're going to put landmines in the English Channel and barbed wire... Sea mines, sure. Uh, landmines, uh, sea mines in the English Channel and barbed wire on the cliffs of Dover. Of course we are going to continue to require many highly skilled workers to come to the United Kingdom and our doors will be open for those highly skilled workers. But it will be done on the basis, funnily enough, as many other countries do so, on the basis of management and control. And if you have the right level of skill sets, and if you can convince a British company to employ you, then of course we will consider and grant a work permit. But the free-for-all, the free-for-all that we've had thus far is at an end. Yes, Ms. Yes, yes, I have to say something at this point. <clears throat> it's very important, I think. Um, I think, because I, I see this in the United States, we have to stop talking about Polish people in terms of electricians, plumbers and workmen in a meat processing plant. There are so many professionals, so many professionals. Doctors, dentists. And I was absolutely stunned.
Khan, when I first became a senator, and I, my first visit to US Congress, and I met with a senator from Illinois, who said to me, oh yes, Brexit. He says, I understand, well, you know, Poland, England, will, uh, will, what will they do without the Polish plumber? And I was a senator, you know something, it's a lot more than that. So let's turn our attention to the millions of people here who are career people, who are at universities, who would like to stay here to, to earn money, and the whole point of this conference is to have a working relationship between Poland and the UK and the rest of Europe and not on the level of plumbers and electricians, we're on high level so that you know when we talk about hoping to have Congress people in Polish Congress people in the United States or Polish parliamentarians here, let's take it up a few notches. It's not just on the level of electricians. Well can I can I just <laughs> I have to do something which I've never done before, which is to disagree with the Senator. By raising the beef processing factory or the care home, I'm not trying to insinuate that we only, that Polish workers are only doing manual tasks. Of course they are involved in a whole plethora of highly skilled workers. But I believe that the man and woman contributing in my beef processing factory are just as valuable to our country as the architect or the banker. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you okay. very much. No, uh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't, I don't wish to put very down great. the guy and the meat processing, or the electrician and the plumber. I am not putting them down. I do realize that they are wonderful people. I'm just saying that we have to take it up a notch. If we want to see Polish people in positions in the government, anywhere around the world, we have to raise them a notch, because your electrician, with due respect, will not be a parliamentarian and will not be a senator in the US, uh, in the US uh, government, the, uh, unless they completely change their profession. The year minister, there was an electrician who became president. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dan, you, you've just taken my line. Oh, I have stolen Stefan's line. But, uh, great minds think alike. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much for this discussion. Um, we have uh, two other speakers, which are just as important <laughs> from their political this is not a private fight. <laughs> viewpoint. Two very distinguished and important um, think tanks that they represent, the Henry Jackson Society and the Polish Nova Confederacja think tank. Uh, may I start with James Rogers of the Henry Jackson Society. The Polish government, as well as many of the Polish community in the UK, raised numbers, numbers of concerns related to Brexit, as you may have heard. One of the issues is defence and security. Many people believe that despite being together in NATO, British departure from the EU will make the country less likely to focus on European defence. Britain may want to send more of its soldiers elsewhere around the world, rather than to NATO's eastern flank. Britain also may be less inclined to participate in joint European sanctions against other states. What is the future, in your opinion, of British-Polish defence relations post-Brexit? Okay, well... Oh, okay, um, so the issue of uh, Britain's role in the defence of Europe, well, to some extent I think the question is a little flawed, because the world is changing, and we're aware of that, and some of that has been alluded to already. So, for the last 500 or so years, the world has been shaped largely by Europe and what has happened in Europe. <coughs> but we're now living in an age where the world is no longer being shaped entirely by what's happening in Europe, but rather what's happening on the far side of the world in the Indo-Pacific region. And that's because uh, China is rising, and as it rises, it's causing a number of different security dilemmas to break out in East Asia, which the United States, Japan, Australia, um, and so on and so forth, are beginning to respond to. So the whole balance of power in the world is changing, so therefore it seems likely that given Britain is the United States' most powerful and capable ally, that Britain will be doing more in the Indo-Pacific region as time goes on. However, uh, that does not mean that this isn't also defending Europe, because as I said, Europe is part of a wider geopolitical system which depends on the um, ability of countries like the United States and the UK to help undergird it and protect it. So that is also defending Europe. Having said all of that, I think it's clear that the UK is going to remain a European power. The, the Foreign Secretary, the Defence Secretary, um, the Prime Minister have all stated again and again that although the, Euro the UK is leaving the EU, it is not leaving Europe, it is not going away. 
And we can see this um, through Britain's contributions to NATO and to the broader defence of Europe within the European uh, continent. Now, this year is an important anniversary. Well, in fact, it's two anniversaries which are related to this and show this. The first, of course, is the 70th anniversary of the founding of NATO. This builds on the 70th anniversary last year of the founding of the Western Union Defence Organisation, which um, in some ways came before NATO and was folded into it, which was the vision of a Labour Foreign Secretary. And it was brought forward during that time um, to help consolidate peace and security uh, in Europe by drawing the power of the United States and Canada and the UK onto the European mainland and preventing the Soviet Union from becoming even stronger or from preventing the rise of a revisionist within the European mainland uh, itself. Now NATO has done its job extremely well. It has basically underpinned the defence of Euro European security for many, many years, for decades, and it allowed the European Union and European integration to get off the ground within the security context that it provided uh, in the early 1950s. It's also another important anniversary um, because it, is, it marks the end of the Kosovo War 20 years ago, and the, it terminated the, the dreams of Slobodan Milosevic for a greater Serbia in the context of the former Yugoslavia. Now, both of those anniversaries were undergirded by British support, British initiatives, whether that be the foundation of NATO or the culmination of the Kosovo War. So Britain is a European power. Britain's role in Europe is part of its uh, wider global defence system, and this is not going to change, irrespective of whether or not Britain remains in the European Union. We can see this for other reasons as well. Britain is the only other nuclear power within NATO which, is under, which has promised that its nuclear weapons will be used for the defence of NATO in all circumstances. It's also the only other nuclear power within NATO's nuclear plan planning group. Now, it also, above and beyond all of that, it compounds mm. its capabilities by projecting its um, forward uh, conventional forces uh, into, well, whether you want to call it Eastern Europe or Central Europe or the heart of Europe, um, it doesn't necessarily matter. But I have lived in Estonia for five and a half years, and I could see the role of the British um, uh, forces as they poured into that country in 2016, and they've also moved into other countries, <coughs> including uh, Poland. So we can see that there is this intersection between Britain's conventional forces and its nuclear forces in the defence of NATO and its allies in Europe, and that's not going to change either. Now, just to bring all of that to a head and to add to it a a further still, Britain has also been actively cultivating its links with other European countries over the last 10 years and even some beyond Brexit, including both Poland in 2017 through a defence and security treaty and also last year with Norway, another country that feels somewhat threatened by Russia's activities on the northern flank of um, NATO. So Britain is going to remain, I think, a European power. Insofar as it continues to um, support uh, European defence, I think it's important that countries like both Britain and Poland uh, seek to get their allies, particularly countries like Germany, France, Italy and Spain, to increase their defence spending to pull their weight within the context of NATO. After all, are they actually going to provide um, the defence forces that are so uh, needed in, in the context of European defence? And I think that's the big task for the years um, to come. So all I would say to sum up is Britain is going to remain a European power. Um, Europe is our continent and we are not going away. Thank you. Uh, now my question to Marcin Hruszczel from Nova Confederacja, a Polish think tank. Uh, Marcin very kindly agrees to come here from uh, Poland as well. Um, Marcin, in the EU today, many experts comment that there is a political asymmetry. Some European leaders, such as Viktor Orban or the Prime Minister of uh, Poland, Mateusz Morawiecki, say that Europe should be based on the strength of individual nations. Other leaders from Germany and France, as well as the voice of the EU Commission, is very different. Europe must be united in order to counter the world hegemons, Russia, China, the United States. Is the European superstate an opportunity? Is it a chance? Or quite the contrary, is it a threat? Thank you, thank you, George. So first of all, uh, thank you for having me uh, in this panel. Thank you for having Nova Confederacja here at this event. And uh, when we talk about this asymmetry uh, visible in uh, European capitals, uh, I think that um, it is uh, specifically about the future of Europe. 
about the vision of Europe, how the European Union should look like uh, in the years uh, to come. And the current leaders uh, from uh, Central European states, uh, mainly from the Visegrad group, such as Viktor Orban uh, or Mateusz Morawiecki, but let's be clear, it's, it's more specifically Jarosław Kaczynski who also advocates this uh, vision. Uh, it is the vision of the Euro of nations, uh, originally proposed by uh, Charles de Gaulle, uh, whereas the German and French leaders um, they, and as well as the European Commission, uh, they opt for more federal solutions, which actually were uh, symbolically illustrated uh, by the President Macron uh, initiative for Europe uh, revealed during his very famous uh, Sorbonne speech uh, uh, in September uh, 2017. Uh, however, even the most ambitious proposals uh, by President Macron, uh, such as uh, a common European uh, inter inter intervention force, um, transnational list um, in the European elections, uh, or the introduction of uh, European digital tax, um, and they are still far away from creating a European uh, super state or uh, the United States of Europe. Uh, in fact, what we can observe in the recent years, um, uh, in the recent developments uh, in the European Union, uh, I mean the Eurozone crisis, uh, I mean uh, the European migrant crisis uh, of 2015, uh, and in, in consequence of these developments, the role of the member states uh, in the European Union uh, has uh, significant, significantly grown. Um, we can observe nowadays something like a, an asymmetric confederation uh, within uh, the European Union with the growing role of the biggest member states such as uh, France and Germany uh, and also um, especially in the context of Brexit um, when the UK is, is leaving the European Union, uh, the Ger the, the Ger Germany and France are becoming even more powerful uh, in, the, in the European Union. Still, the European Parliament um, remains weak uh, in the EU legislative uh, process, uh, with the crucial decisions are still made by national governments through the uh, European Council. So, in my opinion, uh, any attempts to create uh, a European uh, superstate uh, nowadays uh, should be considered as a threat uh, to the unity of the European Union, um, also because of different uh, perception of sovereignty. Uh, we still, uh, in Central Europe, we consider sovereignty uh, slightly different. We are more um, concerned about losing our sovereignty than in Germany or uh, in France, uh, for example. But, to finally to answer your question, um, uh, in my opinion, Europe does not to, to be a super state, does not, uh, does not need to become a super state, uh, to counterbalance uh, the world uh, hegemons like the US, like China, or uh, to some extent uh, Russia. Um, in, in the area of, of trade, um, the EU uh, is still one of the most uh, powerful uh, internal markets worldwide. Uh, so it is able to speak uh, with the US uh, or China as equals uh, in the in the, in the area of trade and also impose uh, retaliatory uh, measures if it is necessary. However, in order to, to, to play an important role um, in the international relations, um, that, that trade power is not enough. You also need uh, a military potential. And I think uh, this is uh, the, the most important uh, aspect of the European integration and the question we have to answer nowadays whether the EU should become also a military power. I, I don't say especially the, the, the military superpower, but whether it should have its own um, 
defense and military uh, potential. Mm, and what we observe in the recent years is that uh, there is a growing consensus in the, Euro in the European Union uh, to develop, to deepen this area of integration um, and we have the examples of uh, the permanent structured cooperation and security on security and defense, uh, the so-called PESCO. Uh, we have also uh, the Pan-European Initiative, uh, um, European Intervention Initiative. So the EU member states seems to treat this area of integration seriously. Even the, the Polish government, which is quite, I would say, Euro-pragmatic and does not, uh, does not um, uh, uh, actually favor this federal uh, uh, European Union, uh, is in favor of the integration in defense and military uh, area. Uh, so, of course, um, the, the question remains about the compatibility of the EU defense and military capabilities and NATO, and I think that if uh, this is somehow uh, resolve this problem if the EU defense capabilities will be compatible with NATO. Uh, I think that the EU may actually be a uh, quite important power in the international relations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we only have about uh, 10 minutes left, and hopefully, I uh, but I hope that we'll still have a couple of questions. But I can see that Daniel Kapczynski would like to make uh, and, and Chris Lewandowski would like to make very brief. Oh no, another hand. And James would like to make very brief comments. Uh, can we pass on first to Daniel, please? Thank you. Can I just say, uh, based on what the last speaker just said, this is the greatest threat that I see for Poland, uh, which is a single European army. Uh, we have a friend here at the back, uh, Joseph Mikowai Ray, please stand up. Uh, this, this gentleman runs Polonia in Buffalo, which is one of the largest concentrations of Poles in New York State, and the United States of America is our single most powerful and important uh, defense partner, the, the own, one of the world's only superpowers. Can you imagine a single European army which at best will replicate NATO and at worst will assert the supremacy of NATO on the continent of Europe? An organization as in the last 70 years, since its inception 70 years ago, hasn't lost a square inch of territory since its inception. And I'm sure all of you know the six countries, when we pull out of the European Union, I'm sure you all know the six countries that are inextricably linked to the common defense of our continent that are not and never will be members of the European Union. America, Canada, Britain, Iceland, Norway, and Turkey. Think to yourselves for a moment about those countries. America and Britain, two permanent members of the UN Security Council. Canada and Iceland, helping to keep the Atlantic open in the event of a war. Norway in the extreme Arctic. Turkey, protecting our southern flank from ISIS. Can you imagine a scenario for our beloved Poland where that very powerful, multinational, proven and tested military alliance is put at threat from the political dogma and intransigence of the European Union. It would be a disaster for Poland. Uh, Minister Anders? Yeah, I think I would just like to simplify things a little bit. Um, I, I feel that the um, real problem is the lack of unity within the European Union. Uh, when I attended a conference in uh, Washington recently, and it was about transatlantic alliance, uh, and I said at the time, I feel that the transatlantic alliance uh, is more credible uh, than the cooperation between different countries within the European Union. Uh, on the historical point of view, I mean, Poland, uh, in 1939, uh, I didn't exactly see its European friends rushing to its aid. Do I feel more comfortable as a Pole uh, being protected by the United States or do I, or, and NATO, or do I feel more protected being, uh, uh, more safe, safer being protected by the European Army? I think the question, if you put it to the people, I think most people will agree with me. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, James Rogers? Yeah, I'd just like to make one response on, on, on the idea of, a, of the EU as a military power, or the idea that the EU is taking defence and security seriously. I'm sorry, this is just a fantasy. 
it's a delusion. Mm -hmm. so to, to create the kind of military capability that is envisaged here, you would need to invest billions upon billions upon billions of euros into it. And no European country, no European country such as Germany or France or Italy or Spain, the big power blocks within, within, within the, the sort of rich part of, of Europe, are going to do that. They simply are not planning for it, they're not going to do it. So while this continues to go ahead, while people continue to imagine that the EU becomes some kind of great military power to rival Russia, it will actually prevent the true um, capability from, or the true alliance from actually uh, delivering this capability, and that of course is NATO. NATO underpinned by British and American and Canadian power, the three, the three countries that provide the mainstay of the alliance's uh, military effort and the majority of its military funding. Uh, Martin, to uh, I think that this uh, fantasy uh, about the European common defense force, okay, we can, we can name it as a European army, is slowly, very slowly, it's like a salami uh, tactic, is becoming real. Uh, why? Uh, also because the assertiveness of the uh, United States uh, within NATO. Uh, the, the President Trump he actually, he called, he insisted on European states to, um, to spend more He's right. on, on right. their defense yeah. right. powers. So he wants Europe to be more sovereign in case of its defense and military potential. The only question is whether this defense and military potential will be built individually in particular uh, capitals in Europe or there will be an yeah. integrated defense policy. In my opinion, the, the PESCO initiative is an example that this is slowly happening and we cannot take it as, uh, as a fantasy. Um, I think that uh, the, the, the rivalry between the US and China pose a significant uh, change in the, in the whole world order. Uh, the US is involved in this rivalry and um, if it will be not ready to face the Chinese threat, um, we are quite, uh, uh, we, are, we, can, we can see that uh, it may also cooperate with Russia to some extent in order to reduce the threat from, from China. And in this situation, Poland may be left alone. So we, we should really consider also um, taking part in the European defense structures. Not uh, in opposition to NATO. I, I'm not saying that. I, I said uh, uh, with with the uh, cooperation with with NATO forces. Uh, look, very very quickly. Look, look I'm, I'm entirely comfortable um, with the idea of serving with uh, fellow Europeans in the armed forces. I was in Georgia um, just before Christmas, where the European monitoring mission is actually holding the line between Russia and Georgia, and there you have. Uh, a military force made up of Poles, of Greeks, um, of Hungarians, of Irish, working perfectly comfortable together. Nobody is actually talking about the creation of a new military superpower. What we're talking about is interoperability, um, actually shared weaponry, uh, so we can actually use each other's kit, and a common defence policy. Does that not make sense? I think it's absolutely logical and sensible. But I think we should not forget the absolute heroism of Polish special forces who fought in Iraq, and particularly in Afghanistan. I don't think that those Poles fighting in Afghanistan were any less Polish because they happened to be fighting within a joint command mm -hmm. than had they been on their own. As far as I'm concerned, it makes sense for us to have a common defence policy because sadly, in Europe, we still need to defend. And if anyone talks about diminishing that, then I think they're making a mistake. To put all our eggs in the NATO basket, I'm sorry, that is nothing. I'm not saying we should leave NATO, obviously not, but what on earth is wrong with having a complementary pan-European simple, simple policy that can actually complement NATO? But, uh, but, all, oh, these, but all, these, all these forces are within NATO. Oh, they are within the well, Polish not, no, forces not, no. in Afghanistan. Yeah. Special yeah. forces are Polish forces that are part of, part of NATO. My son is in the US Army and he's also in special forces. He was in Iraq and they're made up of people from, from Poland, from Italy, from all over the world. Uh, so you can't do that. It's, it's, you're looking at it as if this is going to be better if you have some common European force together with NATO. Why, why just, what are the advantages of that? Uh, we will leave it with this question, as I'm sure that the European <laughs> Army issue will be coming up uh, to us in the future, but I'm glad that uh, we could have had 
uh, various viewpoints on this uh, important uh, case, important issue from the experts here. Uh, I don't know whether I still have about uh, five minutes for questions and answers. Apparently, uh, I do. I think it would be fabulous uh, to hear at least uh, one or two uh, questions from you, from uh, Poles living in the United Kingdom or elsewhere. Uh, so, who would be the uh, first person to ask a question to our distinguished panelists? Uh, Piotr Michalik. Thank you. Um, a question to Daniel. You didn't really answer any of the questions who were asked by by Yurek about our status after leaving uh, um, uh, Britain left to uh, Europe. Uh, it's very, very important to speak to a lot of folks who are still quite frightened. They, they don't really know what's going to happen. They, they, they've been here for a long time and uh, they would like to, to know. And uh, going a little bit further to your um, speech about Brexit, um, probably don't have much time, but um, uh, uh, I don't think you can um, pick us. We are a great nation, we are very proud. We were in a, in a slightly different position before. A lot of Poles came here for economical reasons, they wanted to, to get better jobs and, 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 uh, and work here. Now we had the best growth in Europe for a long time. We are one of the few contributors to NATO, full contributors to NATO. We have a very, very good workforce in Poland. We have very talented people. Um, either you play fair, you, and we are, as, as uh, Senator Anders said, we want to be in Europe, uh, at least for the time being. And if you either, if you want to work with us, with Europe, you have to play fair. You can't pick on a few nurses because you need at the moment to work here and then a few people who would work on a beef farm or a few IT people. Either we work together and, uh, and, then, and then we contribute to our economies together or, or we don't. I mean a lot of Poles are, we had the first target here uh, to recruit Poles from here to Poland because our economy is just great. You know, we are a very, very powerful force in Europe. Poland. So Great Britain, okay, the name is still Great Britain, and then uh, and then we are a great nation too. And I'm not going to go into the relationship between Britain and, and the United States, a special relationship, but you have to respect us. We are very different than we were a few years ago. And then if we, we have to play fair, we are not going to be told as Poles what to do just for somebody else. We would like to help and work together, but we, as I said, we are a very proud nation. With we, and we, I think, can, well, in Europe, we, we, we are playing a very, very important part in, in Europe, and so we have to either work together or not work together. Well, well I, I, I did answer those questions. I, I disagree with you. I said that uh, in the post-Brexit context, Poles will, of course, be very welcome here. In fact, one of the uh, candidates seeking to be the next Prime Minister Michael Gove uh, just yesterday stated that he believes, and if he becomes the next leader of the Conservative Party, he believes that all three million EU nationals who are living in the, in the United Kingdom should be offered British passports. Um, so that, uh, and of course we welcome Poles and we will continue to welcome them. We just don't want to be part of a supranational structure. And we want to demonstrate to Poland that we can have strong bilateral links between London and Warsaw without going through a middleman in Brussels. It's perfectly reasonable to be able to do that. Let me just say to you this. When we pull out, they're going to come after the nine countries that are non-Eurozone countries. There are 19 Eurozone countries, but there are eight or nine countries, I can't remember, that don't yet have the Euro. And they are going to try and force Poland to give up the Zloty. They've made it absolutely clear. And my only appeal to you is this, ladies and gentlemen, and I plead with you on bended knee, never allow any Polish government to abandon the Zloty. If you give up your own currency, you have lost your sovereignty and you are prohibiting the next generations from making decisions as to what is in the interest of that country. We protected our pound sterling and therefore now we have the opportunity to decide whether or not we want to remain in the European Union. But if you give up your currency, that right and that option is not there. And in the last opinion poll, I have to tell you, 
in Poland, 73% of the electorate in Poland don't want to give up their currency. But the European Union has made it absolutely clear you will have no right. So, a single currency, a single foreign policy, and by the way, we are now starting to see a huge divergence in foreign policy between the United States of America and Europe over a very important issue, which is Iran. Do we support our American colleagues in their approach to Iran, or do we go with the European Union Brussels vision of how to control and manage Iran? So a single <coughs> currency, single foreign policy, single EU army, and I disagree with the other colleagues, they have to, if they want to create a supranational state, and I speak as somebody whose sister and her husband work in the beating heart of the European Commission, who tell me that they fundamentally believe in the creation of a supranational state and a new European pan-nationalism to supersede the nationalism of individual countries. Single euro, single foreign policy, single EU army, single flag, and a single parliament. And guess who abuses me the most on Twitter? People in this country, not with the British flag, they don't identify with the British flag. It's people on Twitter with the European Union flag. They identify with the EU and with EU nationalism rather than with Britain and the British flag. But Daniel, Piotr's that point is something hasn't that been we answered. will fight, fight and yeah. fight again. I'm sorry. Can, can I, sorry, Piotr asked us, Piotr asked a specific question, and I think it's absolutely crucial that we do state this, not just for the benefit of Poles in the room, but Poles outside. Any Pole who is here legally in the United Kingdom on the day we leave the European Union can remain and stay as long as they want. There's no question about that. Many, many Polish people have children born in this country. They are entitled to actually claim for British passports. Any Pole in this country can actually apply for British citizenship. <coughs> the issue will be post-Brexit, which is going to happen. It's going to be in a form that I hope is a lot milder and a lot softer than the sort of the rather brutal um, leaping off the edge of a cliff Brexit of some of me, my, of my fellow colleagues. But anyone after that who wants to come to the country will be subject to the regular <coughs> immigration regulations about employment, earnings, and, the, and those sort of things. But any Polish here at the moment and their families <coughs> and their children can stay, will stay. And no, it's the one thing that every single political party, in the, I don't know about Brexit, but every other political party absolutely agrees on. Because quite frankly, we couldn't manage without you, let's be honest. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Daniel, can, can we hear this uh, as well from you, from the Conservative Member of Parliament? Will the, Pol the, the rights of Polish citizens uh, in the UK, will they be secured? Well, I, I don't know how many times, I'm sorry, but I don't know how many, like a broken record, I'm sorry if I appear slightly rude, but I don't know how many times, like a broken record, we have to repeat the same message over and over again. We have guaranteed the rights of all Polish citizens who are currently living in the United Kingdom. Their rights are safe and secure, and in fact, as I've said already, some Conservative candidates standing to be the next leader of the Conservative Party want to give all three million. British passports. We cannot be more unequivocal in that. No, and those people who are seeking to try to portray us as little Englanders, which is going to try to restrict people from coming into, the, <coughs> into our country, are wrong, and they are deliberately spinning to frighten the people. Thank you very much, Daniel. Well, we just like hearing that our rights are secure, even if we hear it again and again. Uh, anyway, uh, we still have the time for another uh, question. Because yeah. yeah, something yeah. which I don't really yeah. and, and then I hear all these different um, Thank you very much indeed for the kind invitation. Uh, can I compliment uh, Minister Anders? Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, of course. The thing I'm going to compliment yeah. you on more than anything is something very dear to my heart is uh, the perception of polls in this country. Polls contribute. The whole point of this exercise has been promoting Polish business, Polish entrepreneurs, and linking us. Not talking about Brexit, this is boring now. <laughs> what the ones who really want no, to I just do wish it would go away to too. help each other. And I've been, as Daniel knows, I've done two events in the House of Commons to promote Polish business. Let's return at the end of this discussion to how we can promote business and better the reputation of Poland all over the world. Whether mm. we're born here, whether we're born in Poland, the US, Australia. That's how I'd like to be last question. Yes, I, I would anybody like to answer? Uh, Mr. Anders, 
Uh, well, I think this is, this is what this conference, uh, all these conferences have been about, uh, frankly. Uh, how do we promote uh, Poland's uh, image? Um, I think this whole question, I mean, you can laugh, but I think this whole question of seeing Poles in a different light around the world is extremely important. It's not just a question of career people, it's a question of perception. Um, it's this, I think, particularly important in the United States. Um, I can see why people want to appear patriotic by wearing Polish costume and making pierogi and kielbaski and so on. That's great. That's our culture, it's our history, and it's a, but you also have to promote Poles from a different point of view, a different level, as career people, and this way promote Poland the way it is. I have people who come to Poland who have not been there for maybe 10 years, like people in, in the government say, my God, Warsaw in nine years has changed dramatically. You have to encourage, you have to present Poland in a different light, different people, different, uh, different level, and encourage people, of course, with England, it's not the same because it's so close, but in the United States, most of them really haven't got a clue. When they come, they're blown away, and I think that is the, the, the best possible way, which is why I really support the 60 million Congress. Uh, keep going, but I think the more you do in the United States, the better, really, because it really does show a different level of, of people. Thank you. I would like to also answer to, to Mr. Kawczynski. Uh, I agree uh, with you that uh, it's not a good moment to create a pan-European state or a supranational uh, state uh, because we don't have a European demos. We don't have a European identity which is developed at the moment. Uh, so uh, it's, 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 uh, it's totally rational that we should not even try to do it now and we should not uh, push to, to do it. It will be, it will, it will happen uh, by chance, it will, it will happen uh, spontaneously. It's happening now. Okay, but uh, it, must, it must be like a, a, a bottom-up process. You cannot okay. uh, push uh, from, from the top to create a European identity. It's a question of time. Uh, but I cannot uh, agree that supranational states are something dangerous or are, are something bad in general, because uh, at the moment we are in a country which is a supranational state, and it is successful, actually. It was able to uh, gather to get together different nations, create some kind of supranational institution, the British Parliament, and it works. Yeah, like Soviet Union. Yeah. Well, so this, this, is, this is just like that. Uh, yeah. Go on. Uh, a food for thought, so please take it into Soviet consideration. Thank uh, you very much. Can I, can, I, 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 can I answer just very quickly yes, on that? Yes, 30 seconds, please. I, I, uh, you'll be lucky. I know, I, yeah, but can I just say, the last thing I want to say to you is, and I'm not going to ask you this question because you've obviously just voted in the European parliamentary elections, so you remember the names of the people you voted for. But Stephen and I, when we go back to our constituencies every week, I, ask, I say to my constituents, and by the way, when you have a parliament that represents 600 million people, think about how big the constituencies have to be when you represent 600 million people in one building. In our case, in the West Midlands, it's 6 million people across a whole region in central England. And I, say, I put 100 pounds on the table in front of my constituents and I say, I'll give you 100 pounds now if you can name me any of the members of the European Parliament that represent you. I haven't lost a penny in 14 years. Why? Because nobody knows who they are. Why? Because none of them live in Shropshire, none of them have offices there, none of them have homes there, and by the way, they work in another country. How is that making them directly accountable to you? I go back to my constituency every week. People can get hold of you. People can hold you to account. People can throw you out at elections. You have no power over the commissioners in the European Union. And they are making massive decisions, completely unaccountable to you. That is not democracy. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, sadly, we have to end uh, this fascinating panel. Thank you very much for all of you.